Okay, I think we are going to start. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce this afternoon session, which consists of two speakers. There might be a short break in between the two talks, but we're going to begin with the first presentation, which is by Alistair Payne. And Alistair is an artist and professor, and currently also head of the Academy of Fine Art at Glasgow School of Art. And your talk is entitled The Art of Research, Second and Third Cycle Degrees, Advancing Practice, or What Happens Next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I'd just like to thank Jan and Kia for the invitation to come over. Uh, I came to the first week, I think, in 2017, uh, presented with a colleague of mine, and uh, so it's del delighted to be back. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for the introduction. What um, I wanted to talk through today, I hope you don't mind me sitting down, I feel very odd sitting down, I don't usually, so uh, hopefully that's all right. But um, I've got two, two, two and a half sections to the talk, and I think I've probably got too much together, so we'll see how far we get. The first part is just about uh, Glasgow now, and a little bit about communities um, of practice, but I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, the second part is really from an institutional academic development and planning mode in my head. So that's the head of school fine art bit, um, looking at PhDs, uh, second and third cycle degrees, and networks and the possibility of networks. And the final part, if we have time to get there, is a little bit about my own artistic research, uh, my practice, how that's developed. And what I wanted to do, the reason for putting that in at the end, is because that's the the fun and exciting bit, and the other bit might not be. So hopefully we get there. Um, so I thought I'd just start, and um, I don't know if, if, can everyone see the screen? Okay. So um, this, uh, as we know from uh, Glasgow School of Arts perspective, we've had, unfortunately, two fires over the last five year period. This um, is a photograph I, I took, actually, um, on the night of the fire. The 15th of June is our graduation for all of our undergraduate and postgraduate students. Fantastic day, absolutely wonderful. And then we all went home, and I was phoned at midnight to race in and start the incident management planning for this second fire, which has obviously put us in a really difficult situation. Um, and interestingly, I gave a paper at an earlier conference in Rotterdam recently about reciprocity in the city and the art school and how much the city has really supported us in getting through these two very, very difficult phases um, in, in terms of the, the context where we are now. So moving on, um, this is not me, but obviously you can see we all have beards in Glasgow. So uh, Paul Cosgrove is uh, the Stowe Project Manager. So this building behind Paul is a building that the School of Fine Arts have been working on. We bought uh, approximately three years ago, um, and we've been planning to open it every year for the last three years. And hopefully this may will be opening. The building will hold the whole of the School of Fine Art, so um, it will not have any other activities other than the Fine Art activities, all of the Fine Art programs. Um, it will have all the technical facility in there as well. And what's wonderful about this, and I mentioned the notion of communities when I started, is really looking at what, what does that mean in terms of a building if you've got your second to fourth year undergraduate students, you've got all of your postgraduate programs, and you've got your PhD students in the building. Where do you put them? How do you construct the community in the building? How do you start to um, make sure that different departments are working across departments, working through interdisciplinary notions, disciplinary uh, facilities within the uh, technical facilities as well, and starting to think about one building, one school. So in preparation for this, um, I'm talking about third cycle awards, and I think we've probably got some PhD students in the room today. Um, I, uh, we, decided to put, uh, to allow or give our PhD students studios. That might be normal here. <laughs> it's very abnormal in the UK for students doing PhDs to get a studio. Um, obviously, uh, there's a slightly different structure as you know between Norway and the UK. Um, but in terms of giving studios, actually we're the only school in Glasgow School of Art that gives PhD students studios, so that's, that's how rare it is. But in doing that, what we try to do is build a community of PhD researchers so that it really enhances that activity, enhances the research, and enhances the way that students can actually engage with the research as well. So it's communities of practice, but communities of research. Um, we've also tried to ensure that 
students undertaking projects are maybe affiliated to or linked to their the undergraduate program or the postgraduate program as well. Because I'd like to see this idea of research. Research, in my mind, is not something you do as a PhD student. I think we'll get through to that in a minute. Research should really start as, your, as a first year undergraduate student and echo right the way through, all the way through that first cycle, second cycle, into the third cycle, and then beyond that into academic research. And I think then you build a culture of research as well, not just thinking research is at the top level. Um, it's actually, in, should be, in my mind, embedded right the way through your study as you go through your undergraduate and postgraduate um, activities. On from that, what we've tried to think through is the notion of PhD cohorts. So in a sense, you have maybe in, in, uh, in fine art here, a, a, paint, a painting cohort of undergraduate students. And they work together, they work off each other, they instill each other with belief and knowledge. They think through different opportunities. <coughs> If you then start to think about a cohort of PhD students in painting, then that interaction, that discussion becomes peer level discussion. It opens up really interesting debate around the subject area, however broad those different projects might be. And it adds, in my mind, to levels of supervision within the BA. Uh, so it doesn't just become about the supervisors talking to the students, the students are talking and generating research and knowledge themselves. Um, so that then interlinks into the co-location of MA and PhD, and the fact that PhD um, students should be teaching, I think, as we have graduate teaching assistantships, so they teach into our undergraduate program and into our postgraduate programs, and that starts to stretch that understanding of research again. It brings it down, as well as back up, and quite often PhD students might be teaching, from a painting perspective, let's just say, a painting PhD might be teaching a group of painting postgraduates and suddenly their knowledge is broadened. It's all of the ways of bro broadening that knowledge in terms of thinking through how that might take place. So just a couple of other uh, photos for you, just of the new building. I'm hopeful um, that you'll be able to visit. We're opening in May for the degree show, and then the big opening is in September, with soft opening in May, hard opening in September. Really looking forward to it. It's been a huge amount of work. Essentially, the staff within my, my staff team, my senior management team have effectively done all of the design work on this, working with the architects, they've done all of the legwork in terms of trying to think through the building and the studios. So once we've got it up and operational, it's going to be transformative, I think. Everything that we do in the School of Fine Art is very, very focused around the studio, studio environment. What is the studio environment? And there was a, a, a mention earlier on in one of the presentations, uh, I think around, you know, uh, environments for PhD students. So I've talked a little bit about community, I've talked about cohorts, but I'm also thinking through studio, location of students within a building, and how that can actually be supportive of the research activity. So um, we have these incredible light bulbs in the building, which, as you can see, the building is from the 1930s. It was an old, um, basically it used to be a further education college. Uh, it was built to teach butchery and things like that. And we've now converted it, well, butchery and car mechanics, which you can eat two things on the same floor. But um, <coughs> and the art school was the Macintosh building. So now with that Macintosh building, we've put the art into the old sort of design-based building, which is sort of all of it back to the front, but we, we think it's uh, quite an extraordinary space. So moving on, I did mention around this notion of the stretching of research through um, undergraduate, postgraduate, and into PhD. So something that we've uh, just started in this last year is a, a course called Research Methods and Methodologies in Practice. It's very much focused around research and practice, but it's delivered to all of our postgraduate taught students. So the students from the Master of Fine Art, Master of Art Writing, Curatorial Practice, Fine Art Practice, and Art Society and Culture. The reason for this is that I believe fundamentally that students undertaking postgraduate level uh, work should understand notions of research. It shouldn't just be left to PhD, because it then means as they're studying through their postgraduate taught element, as they move into considering PhD proposals or um, the, the actual research questions, the methodology they might be thinking about, they've already had an introduction to methodologies. How do you, what do you <coughs> for a start? 
the big question, what is a methodology, what's a method, what are research questions, opening those up for a postgraduate student allows them access into thinking around how they might then develop all of that as they move forwards. So what I've put here are some general course aims, um, and these are about how do you develop research methods. These are some broad uh, facilitatory methods that we want to uh, ask students to be thinking through. Um, and then also to introduce you to explore different research methods. methods. These are the slightly more in-depth runs around ethics and how do you actually understand methodologies of practice. And opening up what different methodologies are. So not just art-based methodologies, but humanities-based, science-based methodologies to give students an understanding that their practice could stretch beyond art as a practice into other ways of thinking, very, in very much an interdisciplinary mode. And these tie directly into their studio-based learning. Um, so as you can see, this just runs uh, for the course of one semester, um, and then the students will be undertaking their normal studio-based projects, the supervision going alongside that as well. So this is um, for all of our postgraduate taught students as well. We had, I was finding we had a cohort um, sort of discipline based, uh, what do you say, silo application of, of the group. So your MFA group would all be in their MFA group, and then your art writing group would all be in their group, and they wouldn't have to talk to one another. So I wanted to try and establish courses, and they are through professional practice and research methods, at which all of those students come together, so they realise that actually the cohort of postgraduate students within the School of Fine Art is 150 not 25 in your actual program, and then it starts to enable discussions around, as a fine art practitioner, talking to and collaborating with a curator, thinking through what those collaborations might be, and how do those collaborations then develop into modes of practice, into outputs, and, uh, and beyond. So I hope I'm not talking too quickly, I'm trying to. Um, another proposition, now I had a, a, a long conversation with Learn about this a little while ago, um, I've had an idea around uh, an internationalized MFA program. I'm really interested in the potential of networks, the potential of collaborations across borders, different institutional collaborations, in order to start to think through differences. But also, how can we work together to inform one another and support modes of practice, give students experiences that they currently don't have, unless they maybe have an exchange option, Quite often at postgraduate, those exchange options are limited due to time constraints. Um, so this model really is a way of thinking through potential five institutions across Europe that would have 50 students, 10 students per institution, all interlinked, all networked, cross-institutional teaching and cross-border movement in a way of understanding different pedagogies, different ways of teaching, different studio environments, different modes of supervision, and just a, a very brief overview of a, of a sort of diagrammatic plan for it would be you'd, you would apply into, for instance, Glasgow. You might study, you would study as a host institution 60 credits. You would then have the opportunity to go move and study at a, a partner institution, let's say Oslo. Uh, we would be taking some of Oslo students in. Uh, in your third cycle, your third semester, you could then move maybe to Reykjavik, and then you come back to your host institution for your degree show. Um, so that type of movement would instill a different understanding for the students, but also if you can capture a mode of staff movement in that as well, it means that staff can then move, understand different working methodologies, understand different platforms for pedagogic, creative, education, and, uh, all of the different things that would support um, ways of thinking as they come back to their own institution. So this is very, very much under a, a sort of de 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 excuse me, developmental mode at the moment, um, and I think it's uh, it's really, really important to try and take that one forwards. And I'll talk you through some of the networks that we've been building uh, as we move forwards as well. Just to jump back slightly, a, a question I had was, um, just as I was thinking through this presentation, was can you teach research? We talk about supervision, we talk about modes of supervision, um, but I wonder, in my mind, is there a mode at which you can teach research? Or is it something we just expect students as they come in to undertake a PhD to understand what research is uh, and be supported by their supervisors? So in a way, that's the reason for looking at those research methods and methodologies <coughs> and practice, 
It's not about teaching research as such. It's a mode of considering how research can be undertaken and how you can start to think things through that exist in the world or think of new things in the world for the world um, and how you can then start to outline uh, your own research project. Another, um, we're working very uh, much on this at the moment. I'm very interested in uh, ideas around the two plus two model, this, this sort of integration between postgraduate taught and postgraduate research. As you know, normally a student would be undertaking either a one year postgraduate program or a two year postgraduate program, followed by a three year research project. I've put creative doctors here as well. I'll explain that in a few minutes. Uh, it's a new project that we're working on. But the two plus two model really looks at um, taking a four year stretch for the students. So they would undertake uh, a postgraduate level of study move into understanding in their second year of their MFA what it meant to write a research proposal, what was research, outline their research questions, and then move into a second phase, which would be the two years of completion of their PhD. So essentially, it's sort of a tightening, but it's about um, a, a way of developing that understanding of postgraduate taught study through into what it means to undertake a research project. So this is something that, again, I'd be interested in how that could be mapped, be modeled across different institutions, whether it's possible, whether it's not possible. In the UK, in terms of the three years, we would have a year one transfer moment at which the students would transfer, they would go through a transfer interview and they would either then be, off, it would be this is not suitable for a PhD, it is PhD level study, or it is MPhil level study and then progress from that point. So the question I have, could you have a research proposal as a master's project? You know, we talk through that um, students are gearing up towards this notion of professionalism in, in undertaking a master's project, but can you have strands in which students start to decide their futures, decide where they're going to move in the future, what they want to do? So some students might want to follow a professional route, in which case they would be very much undertaking studio-based practice with a big exhibition at the end. Other students might be thinking that actually the exhibition route, that level of professional, uh, that professional route is actually not the strand that they want to undertake. They're really thinking about a research project. One thing in the UK, and I'm not sure maybe it happens in Norway as well, is that it's quite often a student who <coughs> their MA or MFA, go out into the world and then start thinking, right, I now want to do a PhD. And then they spend months and months and months unsupported <laughs> or, should I say, supported by an academic at an institution they'd like to study at, in which the academic is getting no time to give that support to write the research project. So in condensing this back in, it would mean that the students have the opportunity then to move directly on, to actually think about what a research project is, and actually have that research proposal assessed, possibly even accepted by their host institution or the internet institution, by the time they finish their master's project. And this is a very bad slide, but a diagrammatic structure of what that would look like from our own MFA perspective. So, um, I also just wanted to mention uh, a new program that we've been developing alongside the, end of the 2 plus 2 and our art, rate, art writing program that we've just started delivering is a Masters in Art, Society and Culture. And they were three words that we used a lot in the, in the two presentations um, just prior to lunch. And I think the reason for developing this program is it's very much, again, a studio-based program, but it's theoretical. So students are starting to understand what it means to think through research. But what the, the ambition of the program is to actually work as an artistic practitioner in the very world. And as, it, as the world moves, we are working in that world. So whether that's politically, through economics, um, uh, working in communities, but it's actually live and working at that time as well. So, I talked about networks and collaborations. Something that we've been, we've, we've been successful on as Glasgow School of Art, working actually with a lot of other institutions around, the, uh, around Europe, are two big projects. One is the Advancing Supervision for Artistic Research Doctorates, which I know that the Norwegian Artistic Research Program are involved in as well. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of that and the Creator Doctors Project. So both of these are extremely interesting for different reasons. 
in the UK, the PhD is very much about a written thesis and um, a body of practice. So I mentioned at the start about advancing practice. Interestingly, in the UK, um, and quite often, I know I was told this when I started my PhD, it was like an eternity ago, but that undertaking a PhD would not necessarily, or well, the intention of undertaking a PhD was not to improve my practice, not to become a better artist, it was actually to know how to undertake research. Now that's a very different way of thinking, I think, to the artistic research fellowships that were here, um, the new PhD structures uh, that Norway are putting in place, and it's also different to a lot of the discussions happening around Europe. And one, should I say, that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, recently examined a PhD project in which the 40,000 words, nowhere near 40,000 words, may I say, but it was very much a creative writing document. It was an artistic project in its own right, the book. And then you had the artwork. And so there were two artworks, and it was a really difficult challenge for me as an examiner to actually think through how was I to, uh, did I agree with this as a methodology of, uh, of submission? Um, in the end, it was a fantastic project. But as an examiner, I really enjoyed the fact that actually it was putting my examination skills to the test, really putting them to the test. Very risky from a student's perspective, because it might not have passed, but he did, and it was a, a really successful PhD in thinking through new models of PhD by practice. So the creator of Doctors is very much set out um, to look and develop a new European third cycle award for higher arts education. You can see the, the, the um, the different institutions at the top that are, that are involved in the project. Um, I think the I'm involved but not directly linked into the project. A colleague of mine is working within the School of Fine Art. But the development of this project would look at enabling us to undertake a PhD by practice, but from quite a radical perspective. So it's uh, an intriguing project that uh, that will has obviously just started and it's in its very first cycle of, uh, of the research being undertaken for it. That's just the, the partners. And then the project being innovative in four different ways. I'll just leave that up there for a second. Um, but as you'll see, um, they've relied on different models of uh, PhD by practice that are, they find really exciting. Some happening in the UK. And the UK is about testing the institutional norms um, in Norway, the move from research fellowships, the change in terms of Bergen uh, or KIB becoming part of the University of Bergen, the changes at Oslo in terms of uh, growing the PhD and what that means, and then starting to look at how uh, that the PhD can shift into being something new, a little bit more radical. So critically analyze the manipulation of materials, the manifestation of performativity in order to address the arts as forms of radical matter. And I think this interlinks into a series of workshops that we're planning to deliver based around artistic research as exquisite practice. Um, so these are a collection of uh, workshops with which we will be uh, undertaking with academics and also PhD students. So I think, I'll just leave that there for a second. There's a lot of text there, my apologies. <laughs> if anyone would like any information about that, I'm happy to provide it. These, th these are things. They're not scheduled at the moment, but they're outline workshop activities that we'll be undertaking. But as you can see, exquisite methods, exquisite mattering, exquisite collisions, exquisite collaborations, exquisite learning, and exquisite environments sort of captures what all of that means. And um, moving on, this is uh, very much about the um, third cycle of supervision <coughs> in the arts to Elliot. So one thing that we've been tasked with within this submission is actually creating a database of all PhD level activity globally. Um, that means that every institution undertaking third cycle level research will be in our database. They, and all of the differences in those types of PhD uh, will be mapped through that database. I think as a, this will be an amazing sort of uh, database for all institutions. It will be shareable because it's via ELIA right the way across all of the European networks. I think it's really interesting for, for a number of different reasons. You know, um, we're looking at a sort of uh, methods of, in, in the collaborations that we're looking at, it's consistencies of approach um, and consensus around that. 
it's, it's not a form of homogeneity. It's not bringing everything together and just making one thing the correct thing, but really looking at a space of divergence. And I know um, it was mentioned earlier by Jern, the, uh, the, the sort of outline of this session, maybe not this session, but the, the artistic research group and looking at next year as well. But it's the, the notion of acceptance of cultural differences. But how can we map into those cultural differences and accept them, but work collectively, work in a network way, um, not through sameness, but through a mode of equivalence, so the level learning outcomes, are, the equivalence of those, but also how can we map the ideologies of those research uh, degrees, those third cycle awards. Um, so that database, and I know, uh, I believe that um, all of the institutions across Norway have been asked for the information um, about that so that they can all come into this database that we're collecting. It's a, it's a project that hope, we're hoping to complete um, this side of the summer, so you can imagine if there's a lot of people working on it to get it done. Um, but I think it would be an amazing uh, piece of work and really supportive of a lot of ambitions right away across Europe. Um, so this is just around the advancing supervision for artistic research doctorates and then a very brief introduction to that as well. I think what's really interesting around this is that the Advancing Supervision uh, Project is looking at six different uh, areas primarily. First is defining supervision. The second is eth the ethical dimensions of supervision. The third is new competencies for supervisors. Uh, Fourth is professional education for supervisors and how do we support supervisors. Uh, the fifth is the art of giving feedback, which is really crucial in terms of developing a research project. And the sixth one is the role of the research environment. And I think the strengthening of networks creates a much broader research environment to work across. There's one final um, consortium that I just wanted to mention as um, Oslo National Academy of Art and Design are involved in this as a Glasgow School of Art. Um, so the Northern Artistic Research Consortium, and we've just put our bid into the European Commission for a project that is titled Meaning Making Me. So again, it's not easy to say, it's mixed, which is much easier, but um, Meaning Making in Public Space. And this is a project that the group have been working on for um, three and a half years, four years, I think. So it's uh, we've got everything crossed that this project will go through. It means that if we can have 15 PhD students across that network, I think it's 18 actually with the new uh, partner coming in, 18 PhDs across that network. Our supervisors from Glasgow could be supervising PhDs in Oslo or in Varland or in Brussels, um, as can supervisors from Oslo. The students would be mobile, they would get to go to uh, workshops through the summer, they would be coming together. Um, and the ideas around me making the public space, I, f I felt trying to get this project together looked at institutional level research, not just about individual research, it was about what are the drivers behind, how, well, how can we collate a project together that informs the school's development, but supports our supervisors and students. So I just very quickly wanted to read, how am I doing for time, have I got? Mm. Okay, I'll not do that bit. Because um, <laughs> I wanted to show some art um, so I just wanted to think through a, a slightly more personal approach and an approach that um, maybe defines some of my academic or institutional thinking through uh, some of my artistic practice. So I, I see the teaching, um, well, art practice, teaching and <coughs> research as being interrelated, being an artistic practitioner or an, art, an artist myself, writing at the same time. Um, in I can't help but allow that to sort of inform how developments within the Glasgow School of Art will happen, how have these ways of thinking actually informed me and my, my thinking around the development of programmes. So just to give you a very quick overview of a couple of different things before I hand over to the next speaker, um, in terms of my MFA, I, 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 I spent a lot of the time on my MFA thinking through painting and what painting meant. Um, but nobody really talked to me about research. Nobody really asked me to ask myself the questions that were sort of going through my mind about what painting might be. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until after I finished my MFA that I realized the questions that I was asking myself 
were actually really, really important in, in my mind. <laughs> Maybe not anyone else's, but in my mind, they were really important in structuring research questions that led to the development of a new methodology through a PhD. So I was intrigued at um, the, the notion of, uh, of painting being very static, it's flat, wall-based, um, uh, and really just this way of, singular way of looking at it, and this in involvement within, within its own discipline. So thinking through that, I then found that by the end of my MFA, because I wasn't really thinking through the research and questioning the theoretical aspects of it, it meant that I was sort of blocked myself into a, into a kind of tunnel that was ever decreasing um, towards the end without understanding why I was doing it. And it took probably a year or two years after my MFA to understand what those questions might have been and to actually start to think through how those questions might lead to a PhD project um, in practice. So, I was starting to think through the methodology aligned into Clement Greenberg's uh, formless theory, which was informed by Kant and Hegel, and uh, was really just developed through, that was the methodology that he, he put in place, but then kind of charted much of the thinking around painting. And that was a very, very, um, for the dialectical, relatively static mode of thinking, and kind of, I was starting to feel a little bit outdated. So the challenge was then, from moving from a, an MFA which was very much about art criticism and making, but not about the philosophy su surrounding that, into rethinking and trying to understand how philosophy might be embedded within making and how it could inform practice to develop a methodology um, in order to undertake that through a PhD by practice. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that I felt quite, um, well it slowed all of the processes down essentially. So my feeling is that if I can build that within postgraduate talk programs, PhD research programs now for students, it means that their development is very much more, um, maybe not academically aligned, but they the, have a vision of where that can move to and an understanding of how those developmental process, processes can support the work and move the work forwards. So I think what I'll do is I wanted to just uh, read, I'm going to jump back just slightly to read something just around the um, Meaning Making in Public Space project. It's one page and then I'll hand over if that's okay. Um, and maybe some time for questions. Um, so this is around uh, the Meaning Making in Public Space but also looking at the uh, idea of multiple publics um, and thinking through the positions, particularly from a, a, a position being based in the UK and as you know, Brexit is not particularly going very well at the minute. Um, and, well, hopefully it doesn't go anywhere and we've got to stay in the EU, but then that's not my decision, is it? Um, so, the, the radical complexities of the social, cultural, and economic impacts upon the ways in which we engage with the spaces around us, whether defined as institutional or non institutional, and what claims can be made to the definitions or types of public space in an ever changing and developing world. What are the important aspects of the or a public in terms of social and cultural activities? And is a notion of public actually better defined as multiple publics? If this can be considered the case, that there is now a need for consideration of a multiple rather than a singular public, in particular defined through nationalized borders, what are the philosophical considerations of a public emerging as a multiplicitous and complex whole? In these terms, and cross-reference against the emergence of new and highly developed spaces, what are the connecting points that set these on a path of correlation? If there are multiple publics, then can the same be said for space and how we consider space? If so, what are the future possibilities for the connections between multiple publics and spaces? The notion of a transitory world sits against ideals of permanence. How do these issues collide or combine, and what are the political considerations of such thinking? So the thematic that we're engaged with is also attached to the claims of ownership against the transience or impermanence of cross-border movement as public space is shifting and developing pace. Set against the expanding cultural presences, inclusion, and social dynamics of our current states, how do we engage with public space and what does this mean to the future of artistic practices? As public space changes and develops, how do we understand the notion of a space that is public or distributed? for the public, or even reclaimed by the public? And what are our responsibilities in terms of cultural production within these sites? 
how can this be seen as participatory? Who are these publics? And what are the spaces that construct our historical and current understanding that will also construct our future public spaces? As artists, how do we engage with and work within the transitory state of being in the world? What are our responsibilities? And how can we affect the greatest impact upon, upon procedural, political, economic, social, and cultural change and development towards the future of public space? What is a public, or can be defined as public, and what are the social, political, and economic orders that control such thinking? For that matter, who maintains ownership and control of public space and determines what is public, particularly when we take into account spaces outside of the institution of art, looking at the city, country, or even Europe, as institutions and the governance and controls implied through these boundaries and for what purposes? <laughs> How can artistic research and artistic practice engage across these complex areas of discussion? And what can be proposed as the potential impact, whether political, social, cultural, or economic, of such endeavor? Considering the diverse cultural impact upon perceptions of public as the world becomes more transitory, what are the implications in terms of this diversity upon national identities? A European strategy interconnected with cultural diversity out of the European context, which is fast and rapidly becoming a reality within that context. And I think I'll stop there. Um, in the UK is, is, is very much around um, 
if you've got the research questions, you set out to answer the research questions. Now, that doesn't mean that the artistic practice at the end is any good. Uh, it can be awful, but you've answered your research questions and you get your PhD because you, you, you can actually, you, you can defend those questions. So it, there's the difficulty in their line of that. How do you create, a, how do you advance practice in the model of PhD whilst retaining research and understanding the research and embedding and <coughs> taking apart uh, a practice in order to rebuild it or answer those questions that actually create, and the, the big term in the UK is the original contribution to knowledge. So if you create an original contribution to knowledge, does the practice have to be in because no, because you open a space of thinking and you thought. So it is. <laughs> I actually wanted to follow up, oh, sorry, I'll jump in with a question as well, uh, on your uh, comment, because obviously there's such a huge difference mm. as thinking of as far as linear to what you described. Mm. Uh, and I was curious if you could reflect a bit on how this impacts not just on the third side, but also in terms of uh, uh, teachers. Yeah. Uh, how, because I know, particularly in the UK, the yeah. PhD position is also a particular position for becoming. So do you have an impact uh, on a bigger structural level? Because yeah. here, uh, you would rarely get into a PhD program at the academy without having had at least five years since you graduated Okay, so very, again, very different. And as you'll see, if you've looked at any, what a lot of jobs in the UK can be lecturer level and academic jobs, and now asking for PhDs, um, which is quite difficult because uh, it then means you have a huge influx of uh, students wanting to take PhDs. That doesn't necessarily mean they have a lot of time out, and um, but if they've got a, a, an advanced research question and they want to take that research, then that's where they come on. And they're coming in as students, they're not. They're paying to study, which is slightly different again as well. Um, and then I think, in a sense, there's, a, there's another level to it once you move forward. So that we, as every eight years, we go through a cycle of um, an assessment cycle, which is a research excellence framework um, for all academic staff, at which we have to, if you've got any responsibility for research, and if you have a percentage of your allocation, even 20%, then you have a responsibility for research. You then have to go through this ass assessment exercise at which nationally you are then judged institutionally and then you are given your money. <laughs> um, and it's very, very difficult for staff who are working on 100%, or not, they are uh, full-time academics. The, how do they get the research outputs? How do they then know the research outputs at a certain level? Um, and also attaining a PhD is not aligned into the ref. But it might be a long into your job. Can okay, we have time for one more question? Thank you. Do you no, have my question was very good. Okay. okay. I, I'm really intrigued by your talk. Thank you very much. I just wondered if you could say a few words though, about exhibiting research, which seems such a fundamental part of practice. And Absolutely. Um, but yet it's very problematic, and it's one that. Uh, you know, intriguing a few of us here, especially you know, I, I wonder how do you go about that process so that you can display the process that it's it's um yeah so that's a really really good question actually. I think um do I I'm really intrigued to see the two PhD candidates this evening for instance putting their displays, uh, public displays of their their artwork as as exhibition. Um, in the UK that wouldn't necessarily be the case. It might be that somebody is given a room and they present to the examining committee uh, the, the work that they've created, and then there's a judgment made as to whether that aligns to the, 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 the thesis that's been delivered, and then whether they can defend both aspects, the practice and, and the thesis. Uh, the thesis is the whole thing, essentially, but the writing and the practice. Um, I'm really interested in the notion of the embedded nature of research within practice. I, I think this is the thing, if I'm really honest, this is where the UK misses out uh, a lot. In terms, that's why I mentioned that PhD project I examined, because that's about the closest I've seen as yet to the writing being art practice as well as the art practice. And they were both really interesting. Um, I'm, very keen to, I'm very keen for the students that I supervise to exhibit professionally um, because then, can, can, is what's written evident within the practice? And how evident does it need to be in the practice? If, if it's embedded, 
you, it, the question being, when you, look at, when you look at an exhibition, how much do you have to understand the research questions and methodology and all of those different things? If it's embedded within it, is it how, how does a viewer or an examiner actually read that within the work without something written to support it? I believe it can be done, but it's deeply complex. <laughs> um, and it's, that's where I think creative got it. And I think some of the programs that we've been talking about in terms of the 2 plus 2 models, things like that, can actually start to think about advancing practice and uh, advancing research so that the advanced practice becomes not, it's, it's um, yeah, involved in that notion of exhibition so that the professionalism of research is aligned. I, I, one of the things I was going to say very, very quickly is this distinction between a professionalism versus research. And I think there in lies a really bad problem. Um, if professionalism and research can be aligned through practice, I think that would be a huge development in terms of where we are and what we're delivering. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw the line here, but then just kind of reminded me that there will be a follow-up session tomorrow, which will tap right into what you're discussing here, and some talk formats of the findings in artistic research, exposition, transposition. And that's happening at stage four. But you're also around later today, in case you would exactly. like to yes, discuss in a more informal way with that. Yeah. We're just going to do a two-minute toilet break while we set up for the next speaker. So uh, please stay put. Yeah, can I just say sorry I didn't manage to show more of my work? <laughs> <laughs> Next. Thank you.